So uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to another session of our Quantep seminar, Quantum Computation for High Energy Physics. This is actually our so, last... Hello, everybody. Oops. Welcome to another session. Sorry for that. Um, so um, this is actually our last session for this academic year. So um, the next month there will be this conference, QCMC, uh, coinciding with our usual date and then the summer break. And so we'll be back uh, in September and we'll announce that uh, program soon. But it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Nathan V from the University of Toronto today. Uh, so Nathan has been making very important contributions on quantum computation, quantum algorithmics, including on uh, quantum machine learning and many other areas, and in particular, uh, very nice uh, results with relevance for the quantum simulation of high energy physics that he's going to share with us today. So thank you very much, Nathan, for being here. Thanks everybody for joining and we look forward to your talk. Oh, thank you very much, Yasser. It's uh, uh, great to be here if, if, if virtually. And um, so, let me begin by sharing my screen. And if, uh, by the way, if anybody has any questions, please, you know, uh, I'll throw it in the chat. And uh, uh, the organizers have been kind enough in order to let me know that there's questions, and uh, we can we can jump in and uh, get to them. So let's um, start this up. Oh no, I didn't mean Shift F five. I meant actual F five. There we go. Okay. So um, basically, uh, what I'm going to begin uh, talking about is new work that we've uh, we've developed that's focused on this new idea of uh, hybridized quantum simulation algorithms. So if you looking at the like you know a TLDR of this talk, and you know decide you want to check your emails or fast forward to the the fun bits, the um, basic story that what we're doing um, is that in the last few years there's been a host of developments. Uh, in quantum simulation algorithms that have led to a triad of different algorithms, each of which is superior to the other two in different ways. But none of them is kind of like the one algorithm to rule them all. So our idea here is basically to say, well, if none of these three algorithms ends up being strictly better than the other ones, then how about we mix and match? Try to use the different favorable features of different simulation algorithms to build a hybrid simulation, wherein some parts of the Hamiltonian are dealt with differently than others. And we find that in, uh, that this can actually lead to some substantial uh, performance advantages in, in certain cases, and also make particular approaches like the interaction picture simulation method, which I'll cover later, much more practical than, um, than previously believed. So that's kind of like the, the, the message, but I'll, I'll begin a little bit slow, more slowly and get to some of this, uh, this stuff later for those of you who haven't spent a long time looking at quantum simulation. So uh, to start at the very beginning of all of it, deep down, if we take a look at a fundamental way that we think about uh, simulating quantum dynamics, um, at least uh, from the perspective of the Schrodinger equation, what we wanna do is we wanna take a Hamiltonian that ends up describing the system and build a time evolution operator. And time evolution operator is obviously e to the minus iht. And our goal is to take this unitary matrix and compile it into a series of quantum gates. And this is always possible in a quantum computer. And that's kind of the amazing thing about quantum computing, I think, is that a quantum computer is universal, which ends up meaning that it can approximate any unitary matrix that you end up giving to it. And Time evolution operator, um, as given by quantum mechanics, uh, is a unitary matrix. So we can always, in principle, build it in a qu um, quantum computer. Question is, how can we do it using a polynomial number of operations? And I guess more importantly, when can we do it using a polynomial number of operations? And kind of answering that question more broadly is kind of the central question behind, uh, behind quantum computing. And this problem is a little bit more subtle when it comes to quantum simulation. And the reason why is because of the fact that we don't know the unitary that we're trying to build. We know the Hamiltonian, but we don't know e to the minus iht. So we have to come up with ways to be able to approximate this unitary matrix, despite the fact that we only know what its generator is. And that's really the art of quantum simulation, to come up with methods that allow you to solve this kind of implicit compilation problem. But Another point that I think is really kind of important uh, to understand is that 
quantum simulation takes place in two different worlds. So the world, the, the world that we're, we're interested in is the world of the physical system. And actually, you know what, let's be a little bit more specific here. What we actually mean is we mean a mathematical model of a system. So of course, reality is vastly more complicated than any Hamiltonian that we, we end up writing down. You know, it's, or as so James famously put it, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And so what we're interested in doing is simulating this useful mathematical model that we're interested in for one reason or another. Now, this model will take place in some sort of a Hilbert space. Uh, well, okay, if you're dealing with infinite dimensions, I guess it's not technically a Hilbert space, but let's not worry about that. So the basic idea is that we have um, an initial quantum state, sign on in, our, in this generic problem. And what we have is we've got unitary dynamics that maps us to a final state, e to the minus iht sign on. And so this is the dynamics that we want to emulate on the quantum computer. And the way that this ends up going is that there's two steps. The first is an encoding step over here, where we find a, a, a map that creates an equivalence between the states in the, in the physical system to the states in the quantum computer, or at least a subset of states in the quantum computer. Because in general, and it's no accident actually that I drew the quantum computer to be bigger than the physical system, because sometimes you'll need extra memory for the quantum simulation methods to carry it out. So generically, the dimension of the Hilbert space of the quantum computer will be greater than or equal to the dimension of the physical system. So this encoding will create a um, map between the physical states and a subset of states in the quantum computer. Now our goal then is to take this nice, smooth, beautiful evolution that we'll, we would likely, or likely beautiful, I guess I should say, for the physical system and map it to a discrete set of gates in the quantum computer, such that this discrete set of gates ends up mimicking closely after decoding the final quantum state, the state that we would have in the mathematical model that's within an epsilon ball of the true state that we would end up seeing. And we would like to be able to construct a simulation in this sense for any t uh, greater uh, and any epsilon greater than zero. And we'd like to figure out how many operations do we need to be able to, to do in order to emulate the, these dynamics. And so that's the idea. Now, generically, with the way that we normally talk about quantum simulation, we usually view it as a state preparation protocol. Sometimes people, especially in the chemistry community, will talk about it as a ground state estimation protocol. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm really going to talk about it just as a dynamic um, uh, simulation that yields a quantum state. If you want to figure out energies and things like that, then you can use this kind of a subroutine pretty straightforwardly with something like phase estimation to be able to figure out energies or using something like the Hadamard test, you can end up uh, figuring out expectation values of observables. So this subroutine allows us to be able to answer basically any question that we were interested in about the quantum system. And so that's why we focus on it. And that's why this problem is so uh, important. And so, okay, well, I probably don't need to really justify this to this audience because, you know, you guys, most of you have probably already drank the Kool-Aid, but, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's start with, uh, with talking about this. For me, one of the real reasons that I'm interested in simulating field theory is because of the fact that it really pushes our quantum algorithms to, to their limits. With field theory, you've got a whole bunch of things that don't tend to end up happening with better studied um, simulation targets, such as, you know, chemistry, Hubbard models, things like that, because you often have a number of op op uh, operators that are unbounded. And um, as a result of the fact that you've got unbounded operators and, and other symmetries that you would ideally like to have conserved for your system, it makes a more rich playground in order for uh, us to push our quantum algorithms. So that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm interested in it. And also, of course, and looking at problems in high energy physics, I mean, this is one of the major um, consumers of classical compute time at the moment. And so as quantum computers end up developing, we expect it to also be a major driver of quantum um, uh, resources. But at present, 
we really haven't fi figured out too many um, well-costed-out algorithms for this. For example, you know, famously, Jordan Lee and Preskill ended up showing that scalar phi to the fourth theory can be simulated in polynomial time. Now, when I say polynomial time, I mean like crazy polynomial time. The error scaling is just bonkers with their method, but it, it works. And so the next generation of this, and I'm going to be talking about some early steps that we've made in this, will be to come up with practical ways of, of simulating quantum field theory so that hopefully we'll be able to, at least for the first generation of error corrected quantum computers, have a serious hope of solving interesting problems in the domain by applying some, some recent algorithmic ideas uh, to attack them. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, um, the Jordan Lee Preskill um, method for simulating um, uh, scalar phi to the fourth theory basically um, ends up working kind of, a, kind of as follows. We've got this, uh, this particular Hamiltonian that we want to be able to simulate. And the way the, the algorithm works is it prepares Gaussian wave packets without interactions and then adiabatically ends up evolving them to the Gaussian wave packet for the interacting Hamiltonian. And the basic idea is that if we turn on the interactions between the two and kind of get them to go closer, what we need to do is we need to do this while at the same time counteracting any of the dynamical fa phases that components of the Gaussian wave packets end up picking up as we get closer and closer. And this actually ends up leading to a huge, huge uh, driver of the cost for it. And uh, to give you an idea, if we're you know, taking a look at simulating this with the scattering problem where we get these two wave packets to go through each other, the number of gates for doing this in three dimensions ends up kind of going like the following. It scales uh, at least like the seventh power of the number of output modes that we're interested in, and worse yet, one over epsilon to the 3.5. So if we did something like wanted to get epsilon even modestly small, like on the order of uh, 10 to the minus two, just kind of looking at the scaling of the number of gates here, we expect like billion-ish gates, even if everything else was free, to be able to just deal with the epsilon scaling to get an error of 10 to the minus two. So this is why I'm saying that, you know, this method, while an important milestone towards us actually being able to simulate field theories on a quantum computer, this is far from optimal. And so one of the things that the approach that I've taken with the rem remainder of these slides is to begin with simpler field theories than uh, phi to the fourth theory and uh, be able to show that we can actually get much more reasonable scalings for the number of gate operations for these, uh, these approaches. And gradually, of course, my aim is to build up my skills in, in this area so that we can eventually come up with um, better models or better simulation methods for problems like this and ultimately push towards even, you know, uh, deeper questions like, you know, asking whether or not quantum computers could actually answer some questions or simulate some problems related to the standard model. So the simple uh, model is war, uh, as warned by the first slide that we spent most of our time looking at is the Schwinger model. Now, the Schwinger model um, ends up um, modeling quantum electrodynamics in one plus one dimensions. And uh, the way that it ends up working, um, at least in this approach where we have it integrated out the gauge field, is we've got a staggered fermionic uh, representation where we have electronic as well as positronic mo uh, modes at every site. And each of these sites, you know, can, um, can hold a fermion in, uh, in this particular approach. And it's just, uh, a, and this over here, these links represent the electric field between everything. So there's a couple of things that are kind of interesting about this model. One of the things that's very interesting about the model is that uh, the model ends up respecting Gauss's law. So if we ended up you know, drawing a box around the outside, the electric flux through the sides of the boxes given by the links uh, is always going to be equal to the charge enclosed inside that box. Now that is something that's very interesting because the Hamiltonian preserves that, but none of the terms actually do directly. So this is something that's kind of fun that we'll get to later about the Schwinger model. But in any case, the basic way that it ends up working is that we've got a couple of components from it. We've got the uh, electric um, uh, field, or uh, a term over here. We have this hopping term, HI, that talks about 
the uh, way that um, that the field can interact with the fermions at the individual sites. And then we've got this mass energy term that ends up giving us a contribution based on the amount of mass uh, that's uh, present in the electron or positronic modes. And a minus sign here is because of the fact that there's you know opposite um, mass energy for the electrons and the positrons at the different sites. So that is uh, the, the model. And uh, basically, uh, what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to first come up with a way of uh, representing the electrons. Now, the electrons, if I go back over here, the, the creation and annihilation operators using uh, this notation over here are these psi daggers corresponding to that. These URs, these are raising and lowering operators on the field. So something like UR dagger acting on the link variables, which might have an, um, you know, a field strength of L in here, will just give you L plus one. So these are these are the kind of the, the two operators that uh, end up going about. This one over here, if you look at it, this is actually just an adder circuit. It takes the, the value in the field and adds one to it. That's something we know how to do pretty straightforwardly on a quantum computer. Yeah, Vladimir, I see you've got a question. Um, in the second uh, term, H sub I, what is X? Uh, X over here is like a coupling strength. So it's just a, it's just a free parameter. Nathan, uh, the expression in the square brackets is not Hermitian because of the minus sign which you uh, put in there. Some people put plus, then it becomes Hermitian. So this X has to be imaginary, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Bye. So the um the um the so this is the this is this is how it's all set up so we know how to do the uh the creation and annihilation operators on these link variables which end up holding the strength of the electric field part that we that is it may not be obvious is the fermionic operators uh, the size over here how do we convert the the fermionic operators which would have the action of something like Psi R dagger acting on zero equals one, but Psi R dagger acting on one equals zero, right? So, you know, it'll create a um, electron or positron in the corresponding mode if, if it's the vacuum, but if it's full, it'll just blow up and the simulation won't allow it. So we wanna be able to build these, but the problem is, is that this isn't a fundamental quantum operation. So we need to figure out some way of mapping of uh, the fermionic creation and annihilation operators to things that a quantum computer understands. And there's a couple of ways of doing this. The simplest way of doing this is the Jordan-Wigner representation. So in the Jordan-Wigner representation, you know, and I've ripped off some slides that I do for the chemistry discussion, but it's exactly the same thing here. Basically, the idea uh, that we uh, have for this is that you know, for every uh, spin orbital or every combination of spin and uh, the kind of an electronic orbital that we want to use in our basis for it, what we'll do is we'll use a, a single qubit that ends up tracking the occupation over here. So for the case of chemistry, where, you know, we really are deeply concerned about spin as well, the, uh, we would end up having two qubits for this. In the previous case, we would only need one. And so the way that we deal with this, and I've, again, unfortunately, forgive me, I've used A here instead of the psi that I used on the previous one. The, these A's are equivalent to the psi's. So the basic idea is that what we want to be able to do is, you know, translate these creation and annihilation operators to it. And the way that we do this translation is actually pretty straightforward. First, what you can do is you can actually just represent the creation and annihilation operators in the poly basis. So let's just take a look at a single site as a, as a particular case. We want to construct the creation operator. If there's only one site in your entire problem, the matrix for the creation operator based on um, this over here is that matrix. And so if we wanna build that matrix, well, we can quite easily see because of the fact that the poly operators form a complete operator basis that we could always write this as a sum of poly operators. And a particular decomposition that ends up working for this is X minus I Y divided by two. So this matrix over here, which is a creation operator on a single site can be built really straightforwardly with um, poly operators. And so one of the problems though, is that this worked this work great if we only have one site, 
but fermionic operators anti-commute. So what we need to do is we need to build in some way of uh, representing anti-symmetry um, uh, in our operators. And so the way that we do this is this hack um, that's often called the jordan Wigner transformation. And a basic uh, hack boils down to the following. If we wanted uh, two creation operators on different sites to anti-commute with each other, what we do is we use the fact that the poly Z operator anti-commutes with poly X and poly Y. And so if we take our second, um, we can take our first uh, um, creation operator to just be this one over here. And now what we do is we kind of bootstrap it all up. After we've defined our first one to be X minus I, Y on the first site, well, we could just take our second one to be X minus I, Y on the second site and put in this Z that anti-commutes with all the terms in the first one. And then this will properly end up building the anti-commutation relations for the second operator while having it also act as the creation operator on the subspace that it's supposed to be acting on or the subsystem it's supposed to be acting on. And so this is how the jordan Wigner transformation works. And it's actually really dirty and kind of inelegant, I find. Uh, there's more elegant approaches, such as the Bravi kit I have uh, in coding. But jordan Wigner is something that I always I exclusively use because of the fact that it's so freaking simple. And the other reason is because it actually often ends up being cheaper when you optimize it than uh, Bravi kit I have. So this is the way that we will translate all of our fermionic creation and annihilation operators to poly operators. And poly operators are things that quantum computers understand how to work with. And so the way that we, as I said before, oh, let's go back, is if we wanna be able to discuss our uh, qubit representation for the link variables, as I said before, you know, the way that we kind of end up doing this is uh, we assume that our links act as the adder operation. So, you know, um, here we ended up having that um oh I, I guess maybe i got my convention backwards maybe you are from this convention adds one rather than subtracting one so i apologize i got it backwards but in any case the idea is that they're both adders and the one of the challenges though that ends up coming up with it is that if we take a look at the original model the space is technically unbounded so we could keep on adding electric field again and again and again to the maximum amount that's uh that's specified by our initial conditions but from the perspective of the Hamiltonian, it's kind of, yeah, it is literally unbounded. So what we do is we set a cutoff um, uh, in the field to a value K to make sure that everything's bounded. Furthermore, one of the things that we do for convenience is we assume that this is periodic. Now that isn't physical, right? Because if you have like electric field, let's imagine you've got like your electric field going from zero to like my minus E, to plus E or K using the notation that I've got over here. What this ends up saying is that if you get to the maximum field and you try to add extra field to it, well, then it wraps around to negative field. So this is kind of like, you know, it's an integer overflow problem that you would have with a conventional computer. And so the reason why uh, we, we take this is that it's possible to prevent this wrap around, but it takes actually a couple of extra gates in this case. And if your system ends up hitting the cutoff anyways, you probably shouldn't trust your simulation. So for that reason, we, we left it being periodic, uh, but if you wanted to avoid it being periodic, you totally can. The value of the cutoff, um, this is some work that Yu Tong and uh, Yuan Su uh, and company ended up doing, uh, actually is pretty modest. If epsilon is the error that we want to tolerate, uh, it's been rigorously proven that you only need a cutoff value that goes logarithmically with your error tolerance. So this was actually a really welcome uh, contribution from my perspective, because it represented one of the first times that I've seen a rigorous bound on what your cutoffs need to end up being for one of these simulations in order to ensure that your error is uh, under control. And so the way, by the way, that we, uh, in principle, end up building this uh, kind of um, uh, adder circuit is the following uh, quantum circuit over here which basically, uh, this is an example of uh, a Fourier incrementer. What it does is it takes advantage of the fact that by doing a Fourier transform, you can transform um, numbers into phases and vice versa. So what we do is we take the input, we Fourier transform it, and then we inc increment the phase by applying these phases to it. That will add one effectively to the, uh, to the number in phase representation, 
And then by doing a quantum Fourier transform back, that corresponds to an increment. So in particular, if we had some state L going through here, this circuit will output L plus one. Well, technically L plus one mod two to the end, but you get the idea. So this is how we end up uh, implementing these guys. So basically in terms of cost, each of these link operators uh, are the incrementers on the, the link variables that we end up having. It basically costs two quantum Fourier transforms. So it could be done in uh, nearly linear time approximately. So the next question is this part over here talks about how we can implement the um, link operators as well as the um, fe uh, fermionic field operators. But the question is, how do we simulate the whole thing? The standard approach that people have, have done for a long time is trotterization. And so the idea is, you know, for example, for the chemistry application, let's just consider that we had, you know, this sum over here. Um, we don't know in general how to implement the sum of Hamiltonian terms. But what we can do is we can use operator splitting in order to say, well, this product of the sums or this exponential of the, the sums with it for a short value of t is going to be approximately equal to the product of the exponentials. So from a compilation problem, if you've got a sum of a bunch of Hamiltonian terms, whatever they are, one way that you could approach the simulation is by building simulation circuits for simulating each of the terms individually. Then once you've built a, a method for doing each of the terms individually, you can glue them together in order to do the entire simulation. The way that I like thinking about these simulations, it's like, it's kind of like, imagine you, you have a light switch. Uh, in your room that you turn on and off really, really quickly. Now, if you do this slowly, what you'll see is you'll see gaps in the whole thing. It won't look like the light's on. It'll look like it's flickering. But as the frequency between the lights being turned on and off increases faster and faster and faster, it's like the light is on, going to be on the entire time. The same thing ends up happening with the Trotter-Suzuki formulas. By rapidly switching between the individual terms fast enough, the dynamics will be equivalent to uh, the dynamics that you would see if they were all on at exactly the same time. So that's the intuition behind it. And so, as I said before, each of these is simulated on a quantum computer, but there's a remainder error that ends up coming about because of the fact that this uh, appro approximation is only literally precise when all of the terms end up commuting. And so the error ends up scaling with uh, some power of the uh, nested commutators for these. However, if you're dealing with models where most of the terms end up commuting, this actually can be the best method available uh, out of all the simulation models. And so in particular, models that end up having a bunch of terms that are local over here will have commutators that are zero for many of the terms. And this means that many of the potential errors that can come up because say maybe this guy doesn't commute with that one over here, many of those can be um, zero which ends up leading to dramatically cheaper simulations for local Hamiltonians using Trotter. And so this actually is one of the reasons why for models like um, the Schwinger model, where uh, many of the terms are, are local, um, this uh, ends up actually being the preferred method. So to give you an idea about you know, the, the Schwinger model, so going back over here, just to put this in context, oh, too far. Okay, so the interaction term is the hardest one. It's pretty easy to be, be able to build circuits for HE and HM, so I'll, I'll skip that. But the problem of simulating the Schwinger model uh, with, um, within the um, jordan uh, Wigner representation and uh, trotterization is the problem of building that interaction Hamiltonian or simulating that piece directly. And so, but fortunately with these tricks that I mentioned uh, before, we can actually go forward and end up finding a um, simulation circuit explicitly for. And so this is uh, actually the entirety of the simulation circuit for uh, one of the, the hopping terms that we, we end up seeing in the Schwinger model. So for every hopping term that we end up getting, we'll need to repeat this quantum circuit a bunch of times to be able to, um, to do it. And um, so that's the idea and these plus one minus ones correspond to those Fourier adders that I described previously. And uh, yes, and this will be an accurate simulation, again, if T is sufficiently small. Oh, now one of the things that I wanna mention, that's actually, I think, really kind of fun, is that 
Well, I mentioned that Gauss's law is preserved for the entire Hamiltonian. If we break it up into short simulations, Gauss's law is not preserved by this, that, and that. And because we're doing our simulation by taking the overall Hamiltonian and approximating this by something like e to the minus i h e t, e to the minus i h i t, uh, e to the minus i h m t, well, Gauss's law is precisely preserved for the idealized evolution. The errors actually are going to lead to violations of Gauss's law with this. And so uh, for those of you who you know, really deeply care about the direction of the errors in a quantum simulation, this actually can be something that's potentially undesirable. So the, um, oh, let me erase this because I did some animated slides, but yeah. So the, um, the problem is basically uh, just this, if we boil, boil down to it, the problem basically is the fact that in order for us to be able to do this, we end up needing to break up our hopping term into two distinct pieces. And the, these pieces were what I described doing previously. And the problem is, as I said, these don't actually end up obeying Gauss's law. But if we don't care about Gauss's law being violated, and we just demand that the error is small regardless, then the total number of operations that we end up needing as a function of the cutoff lambda, which I called k earlier, um, ends up scaling as follows. So the key thing about this, it's actually really kind of neat, is that the cost for doing this simulation uh, in terms of its scaling with a cutoff is actually vastly better than any known method. And the reason why is that basically we ended up going through the analysis of this bounding all the commutators that we end up getting that describe the error and find that this ends up scaling linearly with lambda. If we, uh, because of the fact that we've got the HE term and the HE term ends up going like, you know, the, uh, the field squared in here, the maximum, the norm of HE would be lambda squared. So it's simulation methods that end up depending on kind of like the norm of the Hamiltonian, methods like cubitization or um, the truncated Taylor series simulation method, this actually gives quadratically worse scaling. So this is actually something that's kind of cool about this and shows a path forward towards reasonable costs for simulation algorithms uh, for things like the Schwinger model. And in principle, this can actually be improved further by using high order uh, simulation methods, getting arbitrarily close to linear scaling. But we did this approach, uh, this lower order approach, because we really wanted to be able to have a simple commutator series that we could easily bound. For higher order methods, the commutator series gets really complicated and it becomes much harder to get to a tight analysis of uh, how well the algorithm works. But you can see this is actually really not that bad. So this is a great example. I mean, it's a toy model. Um, I, I concede, but it's a great example showing that actually we can end up getting rigorous error bounds and gate counts for, um, for quantum simulations of the Schwinger model that aren't stupid. So Trotter-Suzuki methods, as I mentioned before, they end up uh, working extremely well for these, uh, these problems. However, they have some limitations. There are some things that kind of suck about Trotter-Suzuki formulas. In particular, they don't have optimal scaling with the evolution time. So basically the scaling with Trotter-Suzuki formulas uh, ends up going like t to the one plus little o one divided by epsilon to the little o one. And what do I mean by this? What I mean is I mean, it's almost linear. So it's um, the, the scaling is can get as close to linear as you want as t starts increasing and you optimally pick the order in order to be able to get this. And further, it gets kind of really close to sort of, uh, or more accurately, the scaling with epsilon is sub-polynomial. Uh, however, it turns out to not be polylogarithmic. Ideally, the best scaling that we can end up getting for a simulation is kind of something more like norm h t plus log one over epsilon. And this scaling isn't linear. And also the epsilon scaling never saturates the logarithmic limit that we can end up getting from it. Furthermore, we can't, we can't take advantage in this approach of um, techniques like the interaction picture simulation and the cost scales linearly with the number of terms in this. 
So the idea basically is these are some pretty negative things. But on the other hand, the commutator scaling is what gave us some really strong advantages for dealing with the Schwinger model previously. So the question is, can we take can we take advantage of the best features of some of these other methods and blend them with Trotter Suzuki methods in order to have a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts for the simulation? And the answer is yes, yes, we can actually. And so just to begin with, one of the things that I want to kind of you know introduce for those of you who haven't seen it is this um, idea that Guang Hao and I came up with um, a couple of years back now. And this idea is called the interaction picture simulation. And now this idea is probably really obvious to many people in the HEP community, but for us dumb quantum algorithms people, uh, we were really excited when we came up with this. And the idea basically is that it turns out that the cost of doing a quantum simulation depends really strongly on the frame in which you end up representing the Hamiltonian. And so the idea basically behind it is that what we can do is by doing a frame transform, there are some cases where we can take a time independent Hamiltonian, which normally we think of as being a simpler representation and transform it to a time dependent Hamiltonian that has a much smaller norm. Now, if it has a much smaller norm for these methods that scale kind of like the norm of the Hamiltonian, that it actually can be a hugely, hugely profitable trade-off. And the idea behind this basically is just the same thing that we end up doing with frame transforms in classical mechanics. So, you know, sometimes uh, in order to represent our dynamics, it makes a lot of sense to switch to a rotating frame in order to describe our problem because it can make aspects of it a lot simpler. So for example, if we wanted to take a look at a merry-go-round going, uh, going around it, it's much easier to understand the problem in the rotating frame than it is to understand the problem uh, uh, from the perspective of the lab frame, because of the fact that you know you have to deal with all of these uh, constraint forces acting on the system, and you know it's uh, it's just kind of a bit of a mess. And so we want to take advantage of the same intuition here by transforming a frame. We can take parts of the dynamics that actually we pro aren't as interested in, and uh, transform that into the frame rather than having to explicitly simulate it on our quantum computer. Um, or at least change the way that we're simulating it on the quantum computer. So the way that we uh, explicit, explicitly uh, do this is that imagine we've got the following case. We've got U0 and U1, which are just uh, two, say, Hermitian matrices in this case. And I'm going to assume that the coefficient A big of, the, of uh, the U, U0 is big. It's huge compared to the small bit. And so what we, we uh, are going to do is we're going to do an interaction frame transformation. So we're going to define the um, wave function at time t to be the um, uh, evolution e to the minus i a big u zero t of the wave function in the interaction frame. When we rewrite the Schrodinger equation, given this tra uh, coordinate transform that we've done over here, the Schrodinger equation for the interaction frame ends up becoming the following. Now, one of the things that's really kind of uh, nice about this is that what you've done is now, if you take a look at this, the magnitude of this Hamiltonian term that we're simulating ends up actually only depending on the small bit now. The big bit now is turning into this rapid oscillation. Now that probably with the frame rate of my camera, it looked, uh, looked uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit messy, but it leads to this rapid oscillation of the Hamiltonian. So we've traded off the magnitude of the term for rapid oscillation. However, it turns out that basically the cost of doing this using a, a method known as the truncated Dyson series, the cost of doing this actually, interestingly enough, um, only ends up coming in with the derivative in terms of the spacing, grid spacing between the time points that we need. So this delta t over here, which is going to be equal to the total time that you're you're interested in, divided by two to the number of the number of bits that you use to represent the time, is the spacing in here. And the cost of the simulation algorithm really just ends up going um, with the um, derivatives kind of times delta t. So by making the number of bits one greater we have the contribution of the error in the, these, these simulations. And this ends up causing us basically to end up um, 
only requiring a cost that scales with the derivatives over here that's logarithmic in the size of the derivatives because the only way the cost ends up coming in is we need to make our time spacing fine enough in order to resolve these rapid differences in the Hamiltonian. So that means that the cost is actually only logarithmic in the, the derivatives of the, uh, of the Hamiltonian and in turn logarithmic of in a big in this case. So this is why the interaction picture method for many of these types of problems is awesome because it can take the big driver of the cost and delete it from the problem for many of them, assuming that you can build a really cheap method for implementing this directly. That's the biggest caveat. However, that typically ends up happening. And so the basic idea is that, you know, the um, in order for us to be able to kind of build the uh, uh, this method, what we really are optimize this method, really what we want to kind of do is we'd like to be able to take this idea and match it with Trotter. So how do we end up doing this? Well, the basic idea that we end up doing for it is the following. And this is a, a theorem that I gave that probably is too complicated for anybody to actually read here. I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Um, but basically what the idea behind it is, uh, is the following. What we do is we have our interaction frame Hamiltonian. What, uh, then what we, we, we do is we say, okay, our interaction frame Hamiltonian is the, something like the following. It is sum over J, AJ of T, HJ, kind of like most broadly, our Hamiltonian is gonna be this inside an interaction frame. So then what we do is we say, okay, I'm going to use one of these methods that ends up having um, scaling that, uh, um, um, that is logarithmic with the derivatives of A of T. Something like this truncated Dyson series that I mentioned, or this other approach known as Q-drift, which ends up looking like a randomized Trotter-Suzuki method. And by doing that, what ends up happening is I end up actually approximating the simulation algorithm as a series uh, that ends up going uh, like the following. It, say I end up applying Q-drift. It will end up uh, causing me to randomly implement, um, be forced to implement a term that goes like this uh, with some probability. Um, and it turns out the probability is AJ of T divided by the sum over J of T of AJ of T, absolute value. Okay, so what basically this method QDrift, what it ends up doing is it says, if we wanna do a time step, we take all of these terms in our Hamiltonian and we randomly just select one of them. We don't do the whole Hamiltonian, we just randomly select one. We draw it with this probability and then we evaluate it. Then what we can do is we could then take these HJs over here and this part, once we've got the HJ decomposition, we don't build a circuit for that directly. We're now going to use Trotter in order to further decompose each of these HJs. So the idea basically is that there's two loops. There's an outer loop, which is uh, a simulation method like QDrift or uh, linear combinations of unitaries so slash truncated Dyson that generates a, um, uh, a simpler Hamiltonian simulation. And this outer loop ends up feeding into Trotter. And so what happens is that this outer loop, we could take advantage of the interaction picture here the inner loop, we can take advantage of commutators. And by figuring out a clever way of deciding what parts of our Hamiltonian we want to simulate with the outer loop that uses these uh, fancier simulation methods, and the inner loop that we want to hit with Trotter, we can actually end up uh, getting some really interesting scaling. And so the thing that's really interesting, again, about this, this scaling is that this cost over here in terms of the, um, uh, the, the total number of queries that we end up needing to subroutines that provide us the matrix elements, which is often the way that, you know, people on the theoretical side of simulation will look at it, becomes now independent on the, the big terms in the Hamiltonian and only ends up depending on the small terms. So this is, this is basically the idea behind how we can hybridize it. And this shows actually in this case that we're capable of getting an advantage over each of the individual ones.
So to give you a case where uh, we end up getting um, uh, an advantage, let's apply this hybridized idea to the Schwinger model. Now, I said, I said that to begin with, Trotter was actually already not bad. But applying this idea with, um, um, with this, um, one of the things that we can easily end up doing is by doing this uh, Q-drift approach with it and the interaction picture, what we actually end up getting is we end up getting now an exponential improvement in the scaling with the cutoff. So that's really, yeah, yeah, sir. Nathan, just tell me we have about 15 minutes, including questions. Wonderful. So then in that case, I'll, I'll, I'll hurry up. But this is kind of like my main, my main point when it comes to this. By choosing an interaction frame uh, of, the, um, um, of the field, we can actually lead to logarithmic uh, scaling with the field strength. And so if you're dealing with an unbounded Hamiltonian that has an unbounded part like this over here, then actually you can pay a totally minimal cost compared to this, this approach that already was previously pretty darn good. So we can get exponential improvements in scalings of some variables by trading, uh, by switching to this. However, in this particular case, there was a trade-off. We've got slightly worse scalings when it comes to uh, the rest of the variables. And so another thing though, that is actually really kind of cool about this approach is I mentioned, well, trotterization doesn't maintain Gauss's law. One of the things that you can do with this approach as well is you can actually force the error to precisely obey Gauss's law. So how do you do that? Well, all that you do is we use a trick that originally Jesse Stryker uh, came up with, which was to impose a penalty term in your Hamiltonian that creates an energy uh, um, penalty if you end up ever having some part of the quantum state that violates Gauss's law. And so by putting this uh, penalty term, which could, it could be huge in our Hamiltonian, at a, um, we can reduce the error, um, uh, uh, or we can use, reduce the violation of Gauss's law. This is a problem because it turns out that if you think about this physically, right, this is like creating a finite uh, potential well in order to prevent, uh, this is like uh, no Gauss out here. This would be like Gauss in the middle and no Gauss over here. So what by setting a finite potential barrier, you kind of end up expecting something like this, right? You kind of expect to have at any finite length, uh, a barrier penetration due to tunneling that kind of goes like one over L outside of here. So to make this violation of Gauss's law arbitrarily small, you need to have a huge penalty on this. So this ended up creating a major problem with this. But wouldn't it be great if we had an awesome method that allows you to simulate big Hamiltonian terms at low cost? Well, we do, it's the interaction picture method. So we just go into an interaction frame of this penalty and boom, these violations of Gauss's law can be made arbitrarily small at logarithmic cost. So that is one of the kind of awesome things that we can end up doing with this. Another thing that I wanna mention that's really kind of neat about, about this is that we can actually also, with recent work that I did with the other collaborators, is that we can take advantage of Gauss's law in order to do error correction actually better than lower bounds seem to suggest. The reason why is because you've got symmetries with Gauss's law. With Gauss's law, if you end up having, uh, let's just go back over here, if you have a violation of Gauss's law at some, some particular point, like say a bit is flipped, if a bit is flipped in this representation, then an electron, which is here, will be destroyed. Okay, normally that would be catastrophic. But in this case, you can see, wait a second, we've got field coming outside of this box that's inconsistent with the charge inside. So you can infer by taking a look at each of these little bits inside here, technically we need to double, it turns out every second link in order to make this unambiguous. But we can take a look at this in order to be able to determine where precisely a violation in Gauss's law has ended up occurring. This allows us to detect where a bit flip has happened inside the system. Now, if you look at quantum error correction, you need, it turns out to be sufficient to do two things. We need to be able to correct a bit flip and we need to correct a phase flip. 
So often what we would need to do is like the nine qubit short code will use three qubits to be able to detect bit flips and three qubits uh, to be able to uh, concatenate this three times to do a phase flip leading to nine qubits for this. However, if we're doing a simulation, say the Schwinger model, the model contains its own bit flip code. So what does that mean? Well, that means we don't need to build in this extra symmetry into our quantum error correction code. It's already in our application. So we only need phase flip code to be able to do this. So for this application, interestingly enough, we don't need nine. We don't even need the lower bound of five qubits, which is the best that you can do in general. We actually end up needing four qubits to be able to do quantum error correction in this case because of symmetries. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm kind of excited about thinking about more holistically um, how um, applications like field theory simulation can be blended in to um, problems like quantum error correction because you have a ton of symmetries in many of these theories. And these symmetries actually can do double duty and we can use them in order to actually potentially make error correction vastly cheaper than we previously thought. So this is actually something that's, I think, really beautiful, potentially about field theory as a simulation method, that, uh, that application or a simulation target, that applications like chemistry may not have. These symmetries are amazing resources for us to be able to, to do it. Here's a measurement circuit, total qubit usage and stuff. But in any case, I'm at the end. I can go over some of those details if people want. But the key thing that I really wanted to get across from this talk, if nothing else, is that we still are, especially for field theory simulation in the early days. We have barely begun getting the concrete estimates of the number of gates that we need to be able to solve problems. And further, we've actually even just bare, barely even started coming up with good asymptotic scalings for the number of gates that are needed. And we need those in place in order to be able to figure out what the promising ideas versus the bad ideas are before we go to the, all the headaches of really counting the number of operations needed. And that is super important because at the end of the day, we really would like to get an idea of how big or how fast we would need to build our quantum computers in order to solve problems inside this domain. And further, by taking advantage of structures that specifically end up showing up in uh, problems in high energy physics, this ends up opening up the ability for us to be able to exploit hybridized methods like I talked about that involve the interaction picture and further exploit symmetries that are in our problem like Gauss's law to be able to do vastly better than what you would naively think. And I feel that you know, by doing all of this, we can, pro we can make not only the existing approaches that we thought of vastly more practical, but hopefully make progress towards the holy grail that I would like to see in my, my career of being able to answer the question of whether you know, all of fundamental physics or at least the standard model can be efficiently simulated on quantum computers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nathan, for this great, great talk. Really, really interesting and cool stuff. So, uh, and also very good with the time. We still have a few minutes for questions. So I would invite anyone to please raise their hand. I see Domenico already. And also I would ask Sagar to please monitor uh, the chat, especially in, in uh, YouTube. So Domenico, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I would ask you, uh, would like to ask you uh, just uh, um, some details about the scheme you implemented uh, for the latter operators of gauge fields. You decompose it in a system of qubits and then you implement the um, quantum Fourier transfer. Uh, is this correct? And how then you insert that kind of gates into the bigger circuits uh, um, where also the matter sides are included? I mean, how yeah. do you couple that kind of transition? Great. So, you know, I can, I can go through this. I, 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 gave, I gave a slide that, that kind of uh, talks about this, but I think I went over it a little too quickly. So let's go back and I can kind of, kind of guide you through it. So, this over here uh, describes the hard term in the simulation of the Schwinger model. This guy over here is the uh, e to the um, uh, negative i x um, 
like uh, you dagger uh, psi uh, plus or minus HC, I guess, uh, uh, T term. So basically what we, how we go about, about doing this is actually kind of, uh, of interesting. What we do is we first, in order to derive this circuit, first thing that we do is we take this particular term and then we use the Jordan-Wigner decomposition to take the creation and annihilation operators here and here and convert them to poly operators. That's what ends up getting the XX and the YYs. It turns out that because of the fact that this is a nearest neighbor interaction, all those pesky Zs that ended up showing up otherwise cancel out except at the two sites. And when we go through it, we're left with this XX, YY and XX minus YY uh, term uh, on the other side. So basically what we then have to do is we have to build this operator over here. We can, uh, so, or sorry, I should say we, we need to build this exponential. And the way we do it is by doing it like this, um, one quarter UR plus UR dagger, XR, XR plus one plus YR, YR plus one, okay? So we, we solve this, we do this fundamental, and of course, the second bit, we deal with the Trotter formula uh, on the second one. In order to, to deal with this, what we do is we diagonalize our operator. So uh, specifically, we find an eigenbasis for all of these operations. This part over here is easy to deal with because it turns out that the Bell basis diagonalizes this. So by transforming into the Bell basis, we can uh, make this diagonal. And by you know, doing some, um, some other tricks, we can diagonalize the U plus U dagger on the links on the other side. And then by diagonalizing, computing the eigenvalues and looking at the, uh, the circuit, or, and optimizing the circuit, I should say. Um, let's go back here. Oh, no, my computer's too slow. The resulting circuit that we end up getting after doing all of those, those steps is this. And that's one of the reasons why you see this kind of like two, this sort of symmetry between them. One is the like XX minus YY bit and the other part is the XX plus YY bit. But everything is sort of like this part over here is like the, the basis transformation that we end up doing for, for it. We then rotate all of these phases and then we basis transformation, uh, do a basis transformation again, rotate, rotate, and rotate. And these correspond to the, the case of the U pluses and the U minuses, as well as some other stuff. So that is basically the strategy that we use for doing it. Uh, it's not obvious to see all of this because what we did is we optimized the circuit in the end in order to minimize the number of two qubit gates. But if you take a look at our paper on the simulation of the Schwinger model, um, it goes through all the transformations to justify this circuit. So I'd, I'd recommend looking it up, but that's the strategy we followed. Thank you very much for the explanation. If I can, can I ask you a last curiosity? Uh, you were saying at the end of your talk that, uh, uh, I mean, the, the same um, strategy that you implemented uh, by exploiting the Gauss law is not uh, uh, extendable for uh, molecular uh, dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have some symmetry in a molecule, for example, a rotational yeah. symmetry, if you have a micromolecule, could it be possible to exploit a similar uh, strategy or not? Yeah. Uh, every symmetry can be can always be exploited. The problem is, is that I've never seen a problem in chemistry that has enough symmetry to be able to go all the way to error correction. What you do have though, in that people use in chemistry all the time, is you have a natural error detection code. So specifically, um, what you have is you've got fermion conservation in, uh, in, in chemistry. So you always know how many fermions you began your initial state with. And if you get to the end of the simulation and you've got the wrong number of fermions, you know that an error has happened and you can reject the data. But you don't know where that error has occurred, so you can't correct it. And so the more and more symmetries you end up having, that always increases your power for error detection. But you need to have this ridiculous level of symmetry in your problem to be able to identify the error and, there, and then correct it. And these, you know, uh, some of these lattice gauge theories actually do have that ridiculous level of symmetry associated with it. And so there may be examples there, as well as kind of topological models 
that end up having the, the, such extreme symmetries that we can not only detect where an error happened, uh, detect that, it, that an error happened, we can also determine where it happened. But chemistry, okay. unfortunately, doesn't quite have enough symmetries, uh, even, even if you start putting in uh, rotational symmetries and things like that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sagar, please, for a last question. Uh, thanks, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, there are no questions on YouTube, but I actually have uh, more of a comment uh, of my own. Um, so there is a technique that might help also uh, when you have uh, symmetry in, a, in the handle volume that you're trying to implement, uh, which is called the symmetry protect protected rotorization. I don't know if you've looked into it. So basically, you just take uh, the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Uh, which is, will be basically you can have some operators which commute with the whole Hamiltonian that you're trying to implement. And then on each trotter step, you can sandwich the trotter step with that uh, operator. So you and you dagger, let's say. And mm -hmm. what, does this, what this does is actually just uh, rotate your systematic error in, in some basis in such a way that overall it is likely to cancel. So sort of oh, like okay. in a random okay. way. Yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah. And so. so I would say that, like, if you compare that to the approach that uh, that uh, that I, I suggested with the interaction penalty, um, that approach will will also work. It'll have um, less of the technical overhead than the approach that I, I suggested for killing the uh, the Trotter error. But uh, the approach that I, I suggested will have a better asymptotic scaling because we've got a log one over epsilon versus the the scaling for the other one should be poly one over epsilon. Yeah, for sure. I think this this can reduce like from n to square root of n if the error yes. was n. But yeah, that's exactly. That's exactly what I what I expect. But that, that's a that's a that's a great thing. I I I I wish I'd known about that earlier. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. And Simone, please. And then probably we should close. But go ahead, please, Simone. Yeah, a very a very general and I think quick question. So you you show you have introduced this very nice idea of divide and conquer and go into, into the interaction picture. Uh, so my only concern about this strategy is that this requires, a, as you have said, the separation of, of our energy or a term, so a strong one and a weak one. And this is exactly a place where maybe other, you know, other uh, methods can be applied uh, we know, I come from tensor networks, so you, we know that the worst place uh, to stay is uh, when you have a phase transition, so the two terms are equal and these kind of things. So uh, I wonder if you have already looked into where is the region that this will work or, or not and so on. So, you know, the, I guess the question isn't so much where, where it will work. The question kind of is where you'll see a quantum advantage from doing this. And the, um, the, this is something that I've been concerned about because, for example, for some cases, you know, if you're just looking at strong perturbation theory, if it becomes so strong that the trivial term absolutely dominates everything else, then like, no, there's no point to, to doing this at all. You can just do it pen and paper. But the interesting part ends up uh, coming, uh, coming about when you're interested in dynamics that, that ends up occurring on comparable scales in one part of the Hamiltonian. So if you're a small part, is still really interesting and really important for understanding the properties of the observable that you're interested in, then this type of a transformation actually be, can become useful on a quantum computer. But you're absolutely right. You know, like this, some of these regimes are regimes where, yeah, like the second order perturbation theory may even be good enough. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I think there are no more questions and also we should close. So let me thank once again, Nathan, for this really incredible talk. Thank you very much. It was a really great way to, to close our sessions this academic year. So I would like I'll ask uh, Rafael just to show the closing slides. Um, yes, so in, in July, we there's actually a, a clash with uh, QCMC. So we, do, we don't have a, um, a session in July and in August uh, is the summer break. So we'll resume our seminar 
uh, on quantum computation for high energy physics in September. And so, you know, stay tuned for the announcement of the program for next fall. And I would like to uh, close by thanking um, all the co-organizers. So Andres Ambainis, Ron Seixas and Simone Montangero and the local team who makes all this possible, Rafaela Ribeiro and Sagar Pratapsi. So thanks everybody, Th special thanks for, to Nathan for, for the great talk today. Thanks for all for participating today and throughout this academic year. Have a great summer uh, and see you in September. So thank you very much and have a good, uh, good day. <laughs>